Imagine you had a time machine, DeLorean or otherwise, and could go back to ancient Greece or Rome. It would help to speak the language, but you might be surprised to find you already do. Because a lot of words and phrases we still use today are actually way, way older than most people realize. So, today we're going to take a look at some modern words and phrases that come from the ancient world. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other etymological topics you would like to hear about. Okay, time to improve our vocab. An echo is a sound or a series of sounds caused by the reflection of sound waves from a surface back to the listener. It's also a model of Toyota that's sometimes sold under the names Yaris and Platts, but that's neither here nor there. The word echo comes to us from Greek mythology. Echo was a mountain nymph who tried to help Zeus cover up his many affairs on Earth. That worked great for Zeus, and less great for his long-suffering wife, Hera. As a token of her gratitude, she placed a curse upon Echo so she could only repeat words said to her. Honestly, that sounds more like a curse on whoever has to hang out with Echo. But we're not gonna criticize Hera because apparently she's super vindictive. Echo fell for the beautiful young Narcissus, but because of the curse, could never tell him how she felt. Therefore, she had to watch helplessly as he fell in love with another, himself. Hey, speaking of which, Narcissism is an excessive interest in, or admiration of, oneself, and is generally considered a major red flag. Though a narcissist would probably say, great, I look good in red. As we alluded to, the term comes from a Greek myth about a super buff lunkhead named Narcissus. Different versions of the story exist, but one way or another, this handsome doofus came across his reflection in a pool of water and was utterly transfixed by his own beauty. Spurning all suitors, including the aforementioned Echo, Narcissus stared at his reflection for the rest of his days. Eventually, his body disappeared, and he was replaced by the flower that bears his name. An idiot is a foolish person. Come on, any idiot could have told you that, but they probably couldn't tell you that the word idiot comes to us from the ancient Greek idiotes, referring to a person uninvolved in public life. And if the reputational damage wasn't enough, those who didn't participate in their civic duties would be marked with a rope dipped in red paint. Those bearing the red marks would then be publicly shamed for their lack of responsibility. It was basically the ancient equivalent of being called out on social media for not posting an I voted selfie on election day. Not participating in city politics was about as shameful as it got for the Greeks, and idiot became a term synonymous with ignorance and selfishness. To tantalize is to torment or tease with the sight or promise of something unobtainable, possibly unobtainium, if you happen to be the villain in a James Cameron movie. But in Greek mythology, Tantalus was an evil king who tried to serve his own son to the gods, so not the kind of king you'd call if you needed a babysitter. For his horrific act, he was given a cruel and unusual punishment, which was okay because characters in Greek mythology aren't protected by the Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and because the king kind of had it coming. So what was his sentence? The gods condemned him to be hungry and thirsty forever, while standing in a puddle of water that receded every time he stooped to drink from it, and next to a fruit tree that was just barely out of reach. The Greek gods were great at coming up with punishments. You need a couple of them around during hazing week. A stadium is a sports arena with tiers of seats for spectators who will be absolutely raked over the coals by Ticketmaster for the privilege. The word stadium comes to us from the Greek word stadion, which was a running event performed at the Olympics and other organized games. Initially, it was the one and only event of the ancient Olympics and it was a fairly short race of approximately 600 feet, so you know prices for commercials during those Olympics had to be insane. The Latinized word stadium is drawn from this ancient foot race, and we're guessing Ticketmaster comes from the Latin for greedy fatheads. Hypnosis is the induction of a state of consciousness in which a person loses the power of voluntary action and is highly responsive to suggestion. It's great for helping people quit smoking, remember details they may have forgotten, and hop on one leg while clucking like a chicken. Hypnos, for the record, was the Greek god of sleep, as well as the twin brother of Thanatos, the personification of death. So we are talking about a very gloomy family here. 
Hypnos and Thanatos lived in a dark cave in the underworld where no light ever touched, and whose entrance was guarded by sleep-inducing poppies. But it was rent-controlled, so what are you gonna do? According to legend, Hypnos managed to use his sleep-inducing powers against Zeus twice to allow other gods to intervene on the Greeks' behalf in the Trojan War. A gutsy move, as Zeus was not the kind of god you wanted to screw around with. And not just because he was usually busy screwing around with others. It was kind of his whole deal. The term hypnosis is a combination of hypno, meaning sleep, and osis, meaning a Brit pop band founded by Liam and Noel Gallagher. No, wait, that's Oasis. Osis means condition. Sorry to make you wonder, Wall. One of Hypnos's sons, Morpheus, was the god of dreams and the source of another modern word, the exceptionally powerful pain relief drug morphine, which was first developed in the 19th century. He's also currently starring in his own Netflix series based on Neil Gaiman's revered comic book series, The Sandman, and was played by Lawrence Fishburne in The Matrix. We'll explain the definition of laconic in as few words as possible because laconic means using very few words, and it could apply to a person's speech style of writing or this very sentence. Nah, not really, damn it, we kind of blew that one. Laconia was a region in Greece that included the city of Sparta. The Spartans were famous for their biting, concise wit, which stood in stark contrast to their more verbose rivals, the Athenians. And fans of the movie 300 will be pleased to learn that we will fight in the shade. The defiant response to the claim the Persian arrows would blot out the sun was based on a real quotation. Interestingly, the Spartans were also quoted as saying, release the Snyder Cut. Perhaps the most appropriate example of laconic wit is the Spartan correspondence with Philip II, Macedonian king and father to Alexander the Great. Sparta remained the only major Greek city not yet subjugated by the Macedonians, and when Philip asked the city council if he would be received as a friend or foe, he received the one-word response, neither. And then the entire Spartan city council exchanged high fives. Draconian is an adjective that means excessively harsh and severe, and it's often set of laws or their application. The ancient Greek legislator Draco, who was not a Malfoy, issued Athens with its first set of written laws in 622 BCE. His constitution granted suffrage only to the male property-owning citizens of Athens, which obviously left out more than a few people. Draco's laws were also notable for the harsh punishments meted out for any transgressions. Steal a head of cabbage? Lose your own head. Owe someone money? Welcome to slavery. Murder and accidental killings? No difference there. Same punishment for both. It was a bad system without any kind-hearted TV detectives to help out. Thus, the term draconian became synonymous with any excessively harsh system of laws. A Pyrrhic victory sounds like a good thing because it's got the word victory right there. But it's actually a success that comes at too great a cost. Pyrrhic is doing a lot of heavy lifting there. In fact, Pyrrhus of Epirus was one of the ancient world's greatest commanders. And while his name nearly rhymed, which is awesome, he was otherwise desperately short of luck. During his campaign in Magna Graecia, Pyrrhus defeated the Roman army in battle, but suffered enormous losses. According to Plutarch, the victory's cost was too great. The armies separated, and it is said, Pyrrhus replied to one that gave him joy of his victory, that one other such victory would utterly undo him. So basically, someone congratulated Pyrrhus on the win, and Pyrrhus said, if I get one more win like that, they'll send me back to the minor leagues. So now, a Pyrrhic victory is used to describe events that carry a great cost in military history, business, politics, and when you eat the entire bag of tater tots but cannot move for several hours afterward. Mmm, nah, never mind. That's still worth it. As every elementary school kid can tell you, a gymnasium is a room or building equipped for gymnastics, games, and bullies given excuses to hurl rubber balls at your head. The word gymnasium comes from the Greek word gymnos, meaning naked, and referring to the athletes who trained there in ancient Greece, who did so in the nude. So basically, a gymnasium was a place to get naked. Please avoid doing any nude push-ups at Planet Fitness. Early gyms were actually more like parks, offering little more than outdoor spaces for exercise. But they soon evolved into more specialized areas with equipment and professional trainers. After all, the Greeks did not mess around when it came to fitness. And they especially did not mess around when it came to nudity. Cereal is a grain used for food like wheat, oats, or corn. It is often used to conceal a secret toy surprise at the bottom of the box. 
And although breakfast cereals are a relatively recent phenomenon, the human cultivation of cereal grains goes all the way back to the Neolithic age, around 10,000 BCE. The word cereal itself comes from the Roman goddess of agriculture and fertility, Ceres. One of the highlights of the Roman calendar was the week-long Cerealia in April, a festival in Ceres' honor that included athletic games and religious rites, hoping for a bountiful harvest. And frankly, a nationwide week-long celebration of cereal doesn't sound like a bad thing. Someone at Kellogg should get on that. Lethargy is... Uh, oh, sorry. It's a lack of energy and enthusiasm. It comes from the Greek word lethe, which means a lack of action through forgetfulness. In Greek mythology, lethe was one of the rivers that ran through Hades, the underworld where Greeks traveled after death. Newly arrived souls drank from its waters to forget their mortal lives, which really makes you wonder what they put in that river. The meaning of lethargy altered over time, with the forgetful aspect of the word being ironically forgotten. That's basically the inception of etymology. So what do you think? Which of these phrases were you the most surprised to learn has ancient origins? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.